Today was such a fun filming day, and if you don't believe in the power of the internet, listen to this. Morgan Chavez from the Lusso Group reached out to us because she wanted to be on the Lady Boss podcast, which I love. I think that was such a great testament to her courage. Turns out she was going to be in Chicago, and we had her down to film. Her brand, the Lusso Group, is a three-tier brand with consulting, business, and real estate. And she really talks about how she leveraged her Amazon career to become an entrepreneur, and in two and a half short years, she's made some major milestone moves. Come listen to her. Morgan, you're a real inspiration. Morgan, I have so many questions for you. I'm so excited to be sitting with you. Super excited to be here. Thank you. Epic day in Chicago to be together and you away from Virginia. Okay, I think many people have the fascination with entrepreneurship when they have a corporate job and they see lots of money yep. flying around everywhere and they think, I could do that better and keep more of that. I could do this myself, right? <laughs> so what got you the courage to jump off the, the ladder, the corporate ladder? I think what gave me the courage is my team. Um, I had already started my business before taking the leap off the ladder. Um, so my team around me were so encouraging. They're like, imagine all the possibilities of what we can do together. If you're here with us full time, you know, we're doing well, you can do well with this too. It was really the push from the people around me that kind of gave me the courage to understand that this is attainable, that it's not just this unrealistic dream. Okay, so explain that. Were these people you actually invested in to start your business or freelancers? These are people who I actually invested in. These, these were my employees, my team. So you actually invested in employees before you left your corporate job? I sure did. I opened my first brick and mortar business while I was the senior manager at Amazon. Wow, yeah. congrats, that's amazing. Thank you. Okay, so you have expenses, you're going to your day job and then you're you know, side hustling at night to keep you know, your family investment afloat. Yes. How long did it take to really cash flow that business? It took me about two and a half years okay. to uh, turn a profit on my initial investment, which, I mean, that sounds like a super long time, but it's actually very short yep. in the grand scheme of, of creating a brand and starting a business, especially brick and mortar. Now, why did you need brick and mortar when you wanted to become a consulting business? So I think that's what gives me my credibility. I always make this little statement, who wants a coach with no receipts? You know, if we haven't seen any experience of this person being profitable, what makes me think that they can coach me to be profitable as well? Um, so I started my business in the beauty industry because that's where my interests lie. And I was able to scale that business and now teach others to do the same. Okay, so the, the real um, effort is showing people how the little details that can make a business very successful and then a separate part of your business you can actually sit as a one-to-one -one coach or a group coach and work on that. How important, or maybe give me a percentage of what drives business, the retail presence or social media? The social media presence is what drives the retail business. Interesting. <laughs> yes. I would say that I spend most of my week engaging with people online, whether it be Instagram, whether it be LinkedIn, Facebook, or even just leads that have come to my website, but none of the business, even the brick and mortar business is doing well if our socials are behind. Interesting. Yes. I mean, it's just so paradoxical because so short time ago, you know, you would just never this find didn't a retail even exist. store. Yeah. <laughs> and you wouldn't find a retail store online. So what's an ideal customer, um, not at the brick and mortar, but in your consulting business that you're looking to help? So my target market is definitely startups. And naturally, I've ended up with those who are looking to start in the beauty industry, simply because that's where my experience lies. Um, I am typically working with people who are in the phase where they have their investment capital saved somewhere, or they know where they're getting it from, they've already secured a loan, or they're in those steps of actual business formation, strategy, and planning. Okay, but in, in, by nature, startups don't have a lot of money. And I mean, not some startups have PE and VC money, but I'm guessing these are smaller businesses with yes. smaller purse strings. So how do they decide they need a coach? I think that we have to educate and, okay. and tell people why you need a coach. A lot of my social media engagement looks like, do you have this problem? How do you solve it? Coaching. Um, one example that I make all the time of 
why do I need a coach? Accountability. Mm -hmm. I talk about it in my book, Leap Off the Ladder, that there's no longer that manager there to tell you, hey, you're, we have waste here, or um, you're doing a great job, here's a promotion. Now you have to do that yourself. What if you need a little bit of reassurance? You know, what if you need someone to play that game with you? And that's where your coach comes in. A lot of times my clients are coming from people who I've had to tell them why they need me. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm nodding to your book. It's a, a um, great title, Leap Off the Ladder. Thank you. Um, massive accomplishment, knowing that you're only a couple years into your entrepreneurial journey. What's the book done for you? The book has really put my money where my mouth is. You know, I'm, I can talk about myself and my brand and my business all day and sell to people why I should be their coach. But being able to really put pen to paper and read about my journey and read about where I have come from. Morgan, I'm so impressed. I mean, the book title is fantastic, Leap Off the Ladder. Thank I know you. so many people think about doing it. But what's it really done for you now that you've written it? Sure. So the book has truly helped me to put pen to paper of my journey and of my story. And it, it just gains credibility with those who are, I'm trying to explain why I should be their coach. Um, they're able to actually get to know me without meeting me, which is pretty cool, I think. And they're also able to see some of the challenges and struggles that I went through as I wanted to pursue entrepreneurship and some of the unrealistic expectations that I had as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we'll get to that. You know, I heard some a man handed me a book like this one time and I was ooing and eyeing over it and I said, wow, this is just really epic. And he goes, oh, it's no more than a sexy business card. And I thought about it. You show that. up at a meeting with a book or a book ad or, you know, a flyer and all of a sudden your whole experience has been elevated. So kudos for tackling that so early into the journey. Thank you. So unrealistic expectations. I think none of us would do this if we didn't have unrealistic expectations. I think you're right. <laughs> So give me a couple examples. What are things that were unrealistic? Oh, well, number one, I thought I'd be a millionaire right away. <laughs> unrealistic, right? I just thought, you know, the business is doing well. I've been able to turn a profit. My team is doing well. They're making great money. Um, they're living well. So why would I not be able to be an instant millionaire? Why would this not scale in two seconds? I have moved really, really quickly with opening my second brick and mortar business less than five years of the first and i have done that without any business loans mm. i have been working really really hard and i'm like this should all pay off tomorrow right i think that was my most unrealistic expectation was how quickly i would turn a profit on my investment capital and how quickly i'd be able to use that profit to change my personal lifestyle. Had you ever thought that a lot of the people that you know you may look up to or the millionaires, they create that wealth through a transaction on the business? You know, the business normally, when you cash flow it and you're dumping money to the bottom line, if the the risk is if people start taking it out to go shopping and do you know increase their lifestyle, yeah. then you don't have stuff to reinvest to make your third, your fourth, your fifth store, which is really creating you know equity and value for your business. So maybe just try to think about you know your net worth as going up rather than your cash flow. You know yes. cash flow drives net worth, but really the business is only worth something if it can be scalable and you know dump to somebody else someday is that a way you ever think about your brand maybe a retail store is rolling it up into something bigger so I do now but at the beginning that is not at all how I was thinking of it okay you know at the beginning I was thinking of how do I achieve what I see around me for myself um, mm -hmm. and, and it was not initially this very thoughtful strategy on how to create a brand that's sellable to someone um, or that is going to withstand the tests of time. It was more so like, well, how do I make, how am I going to make myself be on this yacht and yeah. enjoy these lengthy vacations and travel the world? Um, and I think that it's important to know that with understanding that those expectations were unrealistic, it also changed my mindset about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Ah, uh, cool. Instead of it just being this chase to be a millionaire, it became really awesome to see someone who I've coached actually open their business and do well. It became fulfilling to see that. And and that means you are a millionaire. You yeah. Know? I mean, when you have <laughs> fulfillment um, in your business life, it's so important. And, and it took me a really long time to realize that. I was definitely chasing dollars for, you know, 30 years. Um, that was the measure, the only measure, yep. the way I viewed the whole thing. That was a scorecard. And when I really sat back and thought, like, what other scorecards could be assessed? You know, uh, you know, maybe 
freedom and auto so I did for the, my top three values became autonomy what that meant to me is like I could take off on a Friday afternoon clearly get the work done on a Saturday I wasn't tethered to someone else's schedule I like to work long hours too creativity became really important like how can I make sure I'm able to I call it start forest fires but you know start little businesses and start new ideas and not be tethered to a corporate agenda and three, money. I mean, money is in the top three. Oh yeah, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the number one driver. So when you learn that early on, um, probably you'll end up making more money because it doesn't have to be the sole focus of what you're doing. And purpose is such an important motivator. Yes, and then you begin to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. The entire point of leaping off the ladder for me was to be able to have enjoyment in my work every day. I was successful in my corporate career. I climbed the ladder quickly. I am young and I was even younger while there. Um, and I achieved a lot, but now I'm able to say that I wake up to do something I enjoy every day. You know, we get into that routine of coming home from work and asking your spouse or your partner or roommate, whomever you may talk to after your work day is over, how was your day? How was work today? When my husband asks me that, I'm so often able to respond and say, I had fun. And, and at first he would give me this little look like, okay, that's interesting. But I really do have fun with what I'm doing. I think you have fun in everything you're doing. Yeah. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah. Morgan, I love the name Lusso Group. And as you under told me, uh, that stands for luxury yes. in Italian, which is um, so chic. Thank you. Um, <laughs> would you just tell me a little bit more about when you started this beauty business, what exactly you hope to achieve in that brick and mortar? Absolutely. So my beauty business, Lusso Salon, is located in Virginia. And that business is a hair salon. Um, we pride ourselves in giving a luxury experience and top tier customer service. I think that nowadays it's more common for people to invest in beauty and personal care. It used to be a luxury. It used to be mm. one of those things that's like, oh, well, if I can afford it, I'll go get my hair done. Now it really is an everyday expense for a lot of people. Um, and I think that that has diluted the, the industry a little bit and made it where customer service is a little less valued mm. sometimes. So what we've done at Lusso Salon is remain to be um, an, an everyday hair care service with still those luxury aspects of high-end products and top tier customer service. And again, we're located in Virginia and I have a, a large team of skilled master cosmetologists. And your second location is where? The second location is in Virginia as well, Lusso Suites. And Lusso Suites are micro storefront locations where any business is able to rent a space for themselves. We have beauty businesses there, lash technicians, estheticians, hairstylists, and we even have office rentals. So maybe a realtor who needs to close for a day, they're able to come rent, work easily, and go home. So you're a landlord? Yeah, cool. absolutely. Okay. And when we talked a little bit about coaching, I've been thinking about businesses like yours where you become, you are the brand, yes. you're the face, people want to get coached by you, and they pay you whatever, an hour or a year. <clears throat> and your dream is to make that bigger yes. and go to multiple cities. But when they go to multiple cities, you're not going to be flying over to Houston to coach the you know new beauty founder of a brand there. How do you anticipate tackling that? I anticipate tackling that by making myself a premium. I think that it's important that there's a framework that's coached to the coaches, train the trainer, right? And once they know that framework, they're able to offer a service that's replicated. Uh, but I think that it is important to know that, you know, people attach themselves to you before they attach themselves to your brand, um, which is why it's important that, you know, there is a face, right? Um, so to me, I think that scaling looks like I am a premium offer. If you want to be coached by Morgan, by the founder of the Lusso brand, it really truly will be different than being coached by a Lusso brand coach as well. Yeah, and I think that with your strong social media play, you might also consider what are some online courses or other offerings that people don't expect it to be taught by Morgan, where they could, you know, um, and I've been hearing this a lot lately, dip their toe into the brand. I don't want to go to the, the sub coach, so to speak. Um, I want to dip my toe in the brand by doing a course. And then they say, oh, that felt good. And it was yes. luxury and was premium and great. Now I want to get coaching and maybe they're already connected to the brand. Because I think it's a really hard thing when you go out and you, you network and you're doing the, the lunch and learn or the dinner or whatever it is. And they go, great, I'm doing coaching. And you're like, great, meet Claire. 
you yeah. know, whoever that person is. And they're like, well, wait, wait, I already kind of, you sold me. I want it to be with yeah. you. Yeah. So um, the I think the the Luso me methodology has to also be running tandem. So we, what you're speaking about is the methodology. So it really almost doesn't become about you. Um, yes. It's like we do things differently because of X, Y, Z. Interesting to think about. I think it's good that you have a name that is not your name when you're talking about scaling because that is a hurdle sometimes people face. Second thing is really how do you make it so that it is repeatable and scalable to all the people you hire or else they're tasked with business development and then it's a, like you're searching unicorns at that point. Absolutely. I think another part of it that's important is focusing on group coaching as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's why that target audience is really important being narrow. Yeah. Uh, because if I am saying that, hey, I'm the ultimate coach for a beauty brand, then it's really easy to offer group sessions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another way to, you know, just spread myself a, a, a little a little more <laughs> yeah. and, and give a little more Morgan with the Luso brand is by doing group coachings as well. So if you had to kind of piece and part out your time and your revenue model, how much time are you spending on coaching and coaching business development versus the, the beauty part of the business? The beauty part of the business has now taken the back seat. Okay. I am spending the majority of my week scaling the coaching business, whether it be lead outreach, whether it be um, obtaining uh, contracts for speaking engagements and promoting the book. Um, so at this point, that is my primary focus of my week. But in order to get there, I had to get the beauty business to a place where it has a guideline um, to work without me being there 24 seven. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had to create um, something that's scalable and something that's sustainable without me in it. Yeah. Yeah, which is amazing. I mean, that's sort of the reoccurring part of your business while the yeah. coaching is the, the project side of your business. It is. How do you monetize a book like this? I monetize the book truly by putting it in places where I know it will resonate with my audience translating into a coaching session. That is my ultimate goal. So whether it be that I'm booking a book signing event or I am attending a networking event that someone else is hosting with the intentions to sell the book. My goal is that they read it and they're like, oh, I need to be coached by her. Okay. She's awesome. Let me, let me reach out. So lead John. Absolutely. That is the purpose of the book. And even um, speaking engagement generation. Okay. That has also been a way that I'm able to monetize from the book. Sometimes the book has been just a foot in to a speaking engagement with a room full of people who now are inspired by you and want to follow, want to, get, want to be coached. Awesome. And so how do you scale a business like a coaching business? I think the way that you scale a coaching business is by, again, educating those of why they need you, but then bringing yourself to a level where you're able to be relatable to people. I think that, you know, when we think about people who inspire us in business, like for me, one who pops into my mind right away is Jeff Bezos, who I used to work for. He is not relatable to me at all. I mean, he's a white man, he's old enough to be my dad, and he's the richest person in the world. I don't relate to that at all. I decide to put myself in this place where people can relate to me. Most of my audience end up being black women who are young, who are intelligent, who are ambitious, and they see me and they're like, wow, she's just like me. Why would I not be able to, to learn from her? Why would I not be able to be inspired by her? So I purposely put myself in the face of those that I think can resonate with my story. I think that's a good answer to how do you target the right customer, which is really smart. That strategy narrow and deep is really good. You know your market, you go really deep on it, and, and that should um, be more and more and more customers and clients. I think what I'm trying to grapple with is there's 12 to 18 working hours a day, whatever we have, and at some point um, a coach is you know, you're giving, you're giving, you've got to recharge. So yeah. you, I don't know how many hours a week or how many days a week you can spend coaching, but how do you get to the next level when it's sort of an hours business model? Absolutely. We have to create a framework. You know, I think that the way for a business coaching brand to be scalable and ultimately successful at the level that I think you and I can both see is that we have to create a framework that we can train other coaches to use. Um, once we get to that point, I think that's where we really see that growth. Okay, so um, some sort of Luso group process that 
is sustainable and you can put a coach two, three, four under you and then therefore, you know, the, the company is getting bigger but not you doing all the work. That's absolutely the goal. So what, is, what does success look like in three years for you? Success in three years for me looks like the beauty brand having a full-time manager um, mm -hmm. where I am just hands off in the background, um, which we are getting there. We are super, super close. Oh, that makes me very excited. Um, and from there, I hope to have a team of coaches that are um, in different hub areas. I'd love to see satellites. I think the in-person coaching is the most effective, but I can't be in every state. So my goal is that we start to target large hubs like here in Chicago, LA, Houston, different cities where um, we're able to put coaches in a, in a specific place and touch more people. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I haven't heard the geographic play as frequently in coaching as I have heard the people play. So yeah. that could be very effective. Thank you. What do you think that <clears throat> working at a great company like Amazon, um, how did that prepare you for being an entrepreneur? Huge preparedness in the space of leadership. Um, one thing that I consider to be my strengths is that I am awesome at performance management. Um, and I definitely got that from my corporate background. Yeah, yeah. I have tenacity when it comes to coaching um, performance in that, in that aspect. And I think that that's what I've been able to translate into being a business coach. It's no different to me than performance management of a team or an employee. If I can teach that person how to correct a behavior and how to track progress, why can I not teach an entrepreneur to do the same? Yeah. And so I think that that's one of the most valuable skill sets that I earned working at a company like Amazon. And grind, because yeah. I think they grind their people. Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> we work hard. Yeah. <laughs> if you had to, you know, think about the biggest thing that, the biggest lesson, I take money aside, of what it was to start your business that you said, geez, I wish I would have known, what would that have looked like? I talk about a lot of my lessons learned in my book, but the one that resonates with me the most definitely is being overzealous with my investment capital. Hmm. It's like this instant gratification. And I will use the generational term, I am a millennial. And so instant gratification, I think, is just a part of my makeup, right? Um, and I, I think that it translated heavily in my career as well with creating the brand. It was like, I want two buildings today. I want a full team today. I want all the furnishings today. I want a solid marketing plan, the top tier today. And then you have this money that you've worked really hard to save or earn or have someone invest in your brand. So you're just like, oh, well, I've got it. So let's, let's do this. Let's, let's risk it all. High risk, high reward, right? Um, I think I learned that I needed to slow down. I needed to enjoy the journey. I needed to document my learnings. I needed to document my mistakes and what I was doing well, just like I did when I was in corporate. Yeah. Yeah. Was it your money or did you go out for outside capital? It was my money okay. that I worked hard for mm. and my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I plucked his pocket maybe once or twice. <laughs> okay. No, it's just interesting. I always wonder, like when people raise money, are they more free to go out and invest. Is that the mindset? Well, it's not mine, so let's write a bunch of checks. But when it's yours, um, I remember just being super cautious, which is not my nature. I'm definitely yeah. instant gratification. I, I was like, well, we got to make money before we hire this next person. We got to make money, which has its cons also, because yes. there were times when the market was going like this in one of my businesses, and I could have stepped on the gas harder, but I was so worried about not borrowing money and not you know definitely not going out for capital wasn't one of my fantasies so because then you have to report to people which i was really not a fan yeah. of so um anyway that's interesting well i think those are lessons that are important you can you know always go to the pace of what you're willing to invest and now you have a stronger sense of what actually returns and when so you can make a better plan around it absolutely i think that my lessons learned made me more risk averse um, and so with my first brick and mortar business, I didn't borrow from a family member at all. It was all me. And, but even still, I was just so comfortable spending because I just knew like, oh, well, I want this luxury brand. You know, that's what it's all about. So I'm going to have to spend money for it to look that way. But there was things that was extremely wasteful. Um, and then when I reflect on my corporate career, I did really well because I was not wasteful. 
I was good at identifying waste. I was good at optimizing. And I realized that I was not doing the same with my brand, that I needed to optimize the same way that I did when I was at Amazon running a program mm. for 13 countries. Yeah. You know, why not take that same mindset here with my own? Uh, so with the investment in the second brick and mortar business where I did tap into my dad's pocket a little bit, um, I, I was I was more risk averse this time. I was smarter. Um, I was less wasteful. I realized that some things could grow and evolve and, and be obtained later. And who's your accountability partner? My husband. Okay. He is my accountability partner 110%. Um, and he's also my cheerleader. Good. I have the tendency to get wrapped up in imposter syndrome and be very down on myself. And he is really good at identifying when I'm getting there. And he's he's good at stopping me. He's like, mm -mm, nope, we, we have lots of wins today. This is a journey, not a sprint. Mm. I mean, the best cheerleader ever. <laughs> good message and, and super relevant because it is, um, it is a long journey and some days aren't easy. Yeah. So yeah, great to have that kind of double partnership. That's really important. Absolutely. Anything else you want people to hear about your story that you'd want them to think about? Yes, I do. I think that um, one of the things that I try to resonate with those who I encounter, even if it's just a lead or even if it's um, someone who ends up being a client of mine, I want everyone to know that we all really do have a purpose. Um, I know it sounds super cliche, but I think that we hear it and we kind of let that just brush off. I don't know if we really sit in that statement. Mm. Um, we do have a purpose. We all do truly have an inner CEO, whether that CEO is meant to be a boss at someone else's company or your own. I think that we all have the ability to lead within our passion somehow, some way. Uh, and that can look different for each person. Uh, but I think that it's worth pursuing from, from everyone. I'm glad that I took my leap off the ladder. I've learned so much about myself. And at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, one of my biggest accomplishments with this is being an inspiration to my daughter and showing her that she can do whatever it is that she wants to do because I did it. So I think we can all be that example for someone else. And we really should spend this one life that we have pursuing whatever our passion is. Excellent point, and I think that you're absolutely right. You are the CEO of you, yes. regardless of what else you're running. So whether you're a stay-at-home mom or running a Fortune 500, the things that we're talking about today are 100% relevant and applicable. Absolutely. And I love that we can share that with women and others that are on the journey because um, you know it can be very lonely and we can all have the imposter syndrome if we don't encourage each other and tell each other it's okay to keep going Absolutely. even when the days aren't perfect. Yes. But today was a pretty perfect day because I got to meet you. It's been pretty perfect. <laughs> and I appreciate the time so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This is awesome and a dream come true, really. Who would think that, you know, graduating from college and starting a corporate career, that one day I'd be sitting on a Friday morning in beautiful Chicago having an interview to talk about my personal brand. Thank you for the opportunity to do that. You're welcome.